All right. Thank you for joining us again to another Corporate Underground. This week we have Michael joining us again. And we're going to talk about a topic that's uh, close to your heart, Michael. We're going to be talking about securing digital assets. And you said, like, in particular, cryptocurrency. Um, this is great because I think, I think it was maybe 2017 or 18 when everyone was talking about crypto. You went to a barbecue and everyone shut up about it. Um, and that was when everyone was making their own ones. In fact, I even did marketing for one. I was part of the problem. Um, but... <laughs> Like it's sort of become the norm because of that. And a lot of people have them. And my tip with knowing nothing about this, I uh, tell people is make sure you secure it. And that doesn't mean having it in an exchange or something like that. So I'm assuming that's one thing you want to highlight. But when you're talking about all this digital stuff, you know, I'm digital marketing. I don't really have much cybersecurity background. You know, Matt just sold phone systems. They're kind of technical and all the dark web ever did was sync you know, ships. So, you know, make sure you don't, make sure you dumb it down a little bit to our level, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, um, I, look, I, I've been a, a real sort of fan of cryptocurrency, you know, since it's sort of first emerged. I think I first became aware of Bitcoin in probably around 2011, something uh, kind of in there, 2011, 2012. So Bitcoin had probably been running for about, two years i kind of you know heard of it but it was always just like that thing you hear about but you don't really pay any attention to and then i started to kind of grow more of an interest and then as i started to again this sort of aspect of me wanting to know how everything works i, I just sort of dove straight in to bitcoin and tried to work out how this thing works and it is such like technically if you appreciate cryptography and you appreciate how um peer-to-peer -peer networks and various other things come together like bitcoin is just this beautiful confluence of technologies all sort of working together with this grand idea that we can have storage of value in a decentralized way that doesn't involve a bank doesn't involve any other anyone else other than the people who are party to the transactions you know i can send you bitcoin you can send me bitcoin um and, and you know and there's something sort of inherently beautiful about that the problem is that it's also a little bit is a little bit utopian in in a sense that it is not that real world and there are other problems and un other unintended consequences that come about and the biggest problem is that with a cryptocurrency where the only thing that protects your cryptocurrency is a private encryption key which is really nothing more than a random number at the end of the day a really big long random number if someone else can either steal that random number from you or they can somehow guess that random number, then they can access your cryptocurrency, right? And I think that one of the biggest misleading terms out there is you hear people talk about my cryptocurrency wallet. Now, a wallet, everyone has this notion of what a wallet is. I have my wallet in my pocket. If I take it out and I open it up, other than the cobwebs and the moths, um, there should be... There should be you know currency in there right and so you have this notion of ownership and that somehow my wallet is the protector of that currency and that because you know this is it I, the, the wallet goes in my pocket no one else has got the wallet it's my wallet and my my money is secure in the wallet but in the cryptocurrency because it's digital anything that's digital can be copied so your wallet physically can't exist in one place. It's not physically possible for your wallet to exist in one place when it is in digital form. It can be copied. Someone else can get a copy of your wallet. And this introduces a whole other set, set of problems that make securing cryptocurrency a really hard problem for people. Um, and this whole notion of trusting your cryptocurrency exchange is just fraught with danger. And, it, and people get unstuck. I got unstuck with this myself because I tried to get in early on Bitcoin. I tried to buy, I actually did buy, well, I thought I bought Bitcoin. <laughs> I, I, I invested about five and a half thousand dollars, which is all I was prepared to at the time, back in about 2013. Bitcoin was around about $600 um, a Bitcoin. So I was buying you know, nearly 10 Bitcoin, something like that. Um, and I thought I'll just, just stick it in, you know, I'll just, buy it and I'll, I'll sit on it but i didn't even then i didn't really as a crypto guy i didn't really fully comprehend what i was trusting the exchange with and it wasn't until about two or three years later when i then woke up and thought oh i need to actually transfer 
the, these Bitcoin, the Bitcoin out of this exchange into my own wallet or my own private key, and then it would be, it could be secured. And the moment I tried to do that, and then realized that the transaction was taking like more than 24 hours to clear from the exchange. And I was like starting to message them. And then you start to do the inevitable. You go into Google and you type the name of some company you have a problem with, followed by the word scam. Or, uh, <laughs> or, or uh, fills it out, auto fills it out. <laughs> and, yeah. and all of a sudden you unearth all of the other unhappy customers who've, deal who've been dealing with this exchange. So how much do you lose, Michael? What, what was it worth when you lost it all? Well, well, well you see, this is the thing. It's brass tax. Come on. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it was worth $1,000 because that's what he spent on it. That's what he but lost. Te yeah, technically <laughs> I lost about $5,500, right? So it's no real loss. But, of course, the loss is, holy cow, at one point it was uh, like a million dollars or, you know, $700,000, whatever it is. So it was, would have been, an, you know, a, a good windfall had, had it worked out but I was foolish and just didn't secure the assets. But the thing is, if I'm, if I'm, if I actually know how this stuff works as a technical guy, what, how, what chance does any average investor have at mm. so understanding that, that, even those that's concepts? A, that's a whole different, like my fear where I tell people, you know, to not trust exchanges because exchanges also get hit. So this wasn't just, you didn't lose it because the exchange got compromised. You lost it just because they weren't, cashing out to people the, is that the, right? the exchange itself turned out to be run by a guy so there was a four there was a 7 30 report on the abc the abc of course catch up with everyone eventually and um they caught up with uh this company it was called i got pt whale today because i did the right thing as an australian consumer i was like okay i don't want to deal because there was an exchange called mount gox that got mm -hmm. uh seriously hack i had friends who lost a whole bunch of bitcoin back then like now they must be crying because it would have been worth way more um back then because we we're only talking about 200 dollars of bitcoin back then uh, even then it felt like it was overpriced at 200 dollars. today <laughs> it's at sixty thousand or whatever um and so i had this whole thing well as an australian resident i want to deal with an extra an australian exchange so i did my research did all my googling found this exchange looked them up in ASIC. Yes, they're an Australian company. This is a proprietary limited entity, um, notwithstanding they're based in Adelaide. And then, um, <laughs> and it's an in-joke. And then um, what happened was uh, even, uh, even despite that, um, it still fell over because the founder turned out he was from like India somewhere and there was another guy um, involved in, from New York. Anyway, the whole thing got got dismantled and yeah. um, we never got the the, the the cryptocurrency and I'm still I uh, still a member of some sort of cranky Facebook group where <laughs> all of the victims get our money back yeah. all of the victims yeah. lament every year <laughs> what's happened what's the update on the case and of course it, it hasn't gone anywhere so they, they used to say that the um, they knew that the stock market was in a bubble when when taxi drivers were giving you stock tips. You know, you get picked up from the airport or something. You go, ah, oh, you really need to get into FGU. It's, it's going gangbusters. A couple of years ago, I was uh, celebrating a birthday in Vietnam, and my wife took me to this restaurant where it was completely dark, so that all the waiters and waitresses were were blind. And but they put you into this room, and you all go by touch, and it heightens the sense and everything. And there was a couple, excuse my friends, a couple of assholes from the US. And this guy was talking about cryptocurrency. Oh, I'm this and that. He's blah, blah, blah with his friend. He was sucking that job at nobody's business. Mm. And the waitress comes up and in the dark, and I guess I could hear him still going, blah, 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 blah. It's twice as loud. And the waitress just started, started talking to him about the price of Bitcoin. <laughs> now, this is this is a blind waitress in, mm -hmm. in, in Vietnam and not even in the capital. We were in a smaller part of there talking Bitcoin currency prices and what it would do today and everything. So that's when I think you know it's a bubble when yeah. when people that really don't have the money to invest in it um, as a waitress are, are talking about the prices. Would you say oh. it's a bubble? Well, what is a bubble? I mean, I'm not an economist, so I can't really speak to like what is a bubble. And then you, you then you know people talk about uh, what is it the tulip tulip mania and there's sort of yeah, there's been much of them, history. yeah. Yep. um where south sea china there's there was a whole there's a whole bunch of them yeah and there's no question that this notion of speculation and, and sort of you know everyone wants to get rich right and 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 if you could get rich quick you know why not right um but the problem is it's just not sustainable in the in the long term i think history proves that time and time again um and i think you know there's there's 
two, there's different types of investors or people who will act on that speculation as well. I think that's one of the big issues is that you, you see all of these bad actors who are still involved in the cryptocurrency space. Um, and there have been lots of different researchers that have pulled together different sort of analyses of blockchain transactions and all these sorts of things. And um, when Mt. Gox uh, got hacked, um, they pulled all of the transaction records out of that case. And there was a, a great, uh, there's a researcher who wrote a really great paper on showing that there was actual manipulation within that exchange where you had bad actors who were deliberately uh, manipulating the exchange, the price of Bitcoin as early as 2010, 2011, 2012, before, you know, a lot of people even knew about Bitcoin. There were still bad actors back then, like just trying to exploit it. And I think there's always this notion of, of people trying to just get whatever edge they can get to make those mm -hmm. quick wins. Um, I did that, my that own... Happens. But that happens in everything. You look at art, yeah. people will buy an art picture and then they'll sell it to their friends so it goes up and then the rest of the art that they've got goes up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we, we do this in everything, house pricing. You know, everything is, goes through a bubble, right? Mm -hmm. just depends on whether you think it's a Ponzi scheme at the time and whereabouts you get out. You know, like well, there's all, all sorts of ways that this gets cut. The yeah. issue that comes down more with Bitcoin is the plethora of uh, um, the ones that are coming behind it, the Ethereum, the, you know, the, the dock, the, the, all of these other things that are coming through. But what it is doing, and what I'd like to get your point of view, I know you're not an economist, but most economists are wrong anyway. If you look at anything, it's always the call afterwards. You're at the cutting front of what's actually happening with the technology. Now, Bitcoin itself doesn't interest me. You know, and it's the technology that actually comes from what you said at the beginning, which is the um, ability to transfer money. The banks have been ripping off everybody for years. Uh, business has been ripping off everybody for years. And having a transaction that used to take seven days or how long a check would take to happen in seconds between you and I, between my phone. And if you look at what the Chinese are doing with WeChat and everything else in regards to how many transactions happen where the money stays within that group of people, it never goes outside. You know, there was a really interesting uh, um, thing recently on TV where they had how long the dollar stays in your community where like with the Jewish community, it was like 30 days and the Chinese community, it was 20 days and the white community, it was 15 days and the black community it was about three hours the, the, before they gave that money outside of their, commu their mm -hmm. community. Um, this I kind of see with the same. With business and Bitcoin, you could actually hold that coin inside a community, passing that information around and actually changing the way that we finance everything. That's what's interesting to me. How do you see it happening? What do you see the technology to do? I think, again, this comes back to this fundamental challenge of centralization versus decentralization. So a lot of the crypto, you know, a lot of the promise of cryptocurrency is that you don't have to rely on a government or a regulator or a bank or any kind of central authority to play a part in the system that you can have effectively a commonwealth, which is, you know, people have their own wealth stored in their own accounts and they can just freely exchange between those accounts. Um, and that all seems really well in principle, and certainly that might, you know, assist with what you're talking about, about sort of trying to keep money within certain communities and so forth. But um, I think even though that, that sort of the fundamentals of free market might override that to some extent, um, you've then um, got some, some challenges around what happens when some, someone makes a, trans, a mistake in a transaction in a cryptocurrency environment, right? Uh, cryptography is based on math. Math is absolute. And when you do a transaction that has a digital signature and the digital signature verifies the transaction is completed and there is no way technically for the money to be refunded. Like there's no part of the, the makeup of the, the function of doing a transaction. It is a, it is a final transaction. I send you some cryptocurrency you've got the cryptocurrency, but if I got your address wrong, or what happens now is there's some malware on my computer that I don't know about that, and there's, there's mal, the most, one of the most common cryptocurrency types of malware is no more complex than a clipboard replacement tool that looks for what sits on your computer, waits for you to copy and paste a cryptocurrency uh, address, 
and takes that as an opportunity to replace the address you're pasting with the address of the attacker who get, then gets the cryptocurrency sent to nice. them instead. And because <laughs> clean. That's clean. It's, it's, yeah. it's, clever, it's clever, right? And there's no shortage of these clever types of attacks that these bad actors can, can give. And then the problem is if you set up that whole system to be decentralized, you, you've lost control of what happens in those situations. And as a victim of, of this crime, I've actually got no way, no mechanism to get those funds back. Whereas if it's in traditional banking network or it's in a, it's in a network that has some form of centralization, there are some safeguards in place. There are so, so there is this real sort of balance we need to reach at some point. And I think yeah, that's cause, cause money, yeah, cause money really is just a form of trust. Um, and it's a made up concept. Yep. And same as same as Australia, it's a made up concept. Someone yep. someone named it two hundred years ago. This is we call this Australia, and we'll create a whole idea around that. So money is is only works when there's enough trust that I'm being handed this money and hand it someone else. The people will pay me if it's in the bank, all those sort of things. And there's been, you know, all sorts of things that government will change their mind: deflation, inflation, all of those things. Um, where they've re uh, certainly it's never happened in Australia, but certain countries have just gone well. Your money was worth this much. We've now just scrap all that's worth something else, which you know mm. takes away all the credibility and the trust in a government. Um, but yeah, you, you, you're right. What you're basically saying is that there isn't enough trust around the the mechanism for it for people to go. You know what? Great idea, but what happens when something goes wrong? I don't trust you enough to be able to go. Yeah, I can put my five thousand five hundred dollars in this and know that if I want to take it out, I can. Which is we've had that built up of trust with regular banks. But Ronan, hasn't yeah. that changed? I mean, didn't uh, there was a country in America? Uh, um, uh, I can't think of the name at the moment. It was an American subsidiary uh, state, uh, um, and they've just said our our currency is Bitcoin. A whole country e has Ecuador finally have done that. Ecuador, yeah, Ecuador. Ecuador, yeah. So Ecuador is just turned around. A whole country. So once a country's gone, you know, as you say, the, the, I mean, like when I was talking about transferring money, we've got the Australian dollar that can get transferred around Australia. But we try and take that outside and pay for that in Ecuador, and they're going to go no. But I can take uh, Bitcoin and take that anywhere, and somebody will give me the value of that. Now, Michael, mm. I understand what you're saying. There's, there's a piece of code that takes. But if I was putting in transferring money to Ronan, and I could have the same code put it into a bank that would transfer that off to his account. I've got Buckley's of getting that back. If that is in Romania, or if that is in Venezuela, or if that is in well, wherever, and then they can transfer that out of that to somewhere else, to somewhere else, and it bounces around. Now, I was hacked at the very, very beginning of the internet, right? Um, my company, we lost, I think, $10,000. And this was in the, you know, 97, 98. We had the federal government, we had the banking commission, we had like, because this is like one of the very first hacks that had ever happened in the history of hacking in Australia. And we had the police, we had federal, we had all these people coming through. Now I'm going to say there wouldn't be one person would bat an eyelid to lose $10,000 in a banking system. But right then it was the weirdest thing and they needed to find this person that went through. It, it's now become sort of like an insurance that people put on our, our money. Like they turn around and they will get, give you the money back, but we pay higher interest for banking. We pay for all these profits that they do to be able to, to shore this up. Bitcoin doesn't have that. So the cleanness of Bitcoin hasn't got the, the backup. That's probably the only problem. Now, if they built up mm. an exchange that actually had been around that, and let's say the Ecuador government set up an exchange that was backed by them or the American government or somebody had more trust, would that take away some of those problems for you? Um, I, I think still the problem is is one of tech, technical and personal responsibility around securing of those digital assets. I, I think I just don't think you can have a pure. I don't think we can expect every single person to have the technical knowledge to be able to secure these digital assets to the extent that would keep them safe. I think there are always going to there are always laggards in technology. No matter how much you try to to tell people how to create a strong password, there is a small percentage of people who will never create strong passwords. No. That's just what's, what's wrong with ABC one two three. I don't understand. That's yeah, like a letters and zero. numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so for me, that's where you start to look at inequities of you know people are being disadvantaged you know because they haven't got the knowledge to be able to 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 keep their money secure in that kind of environment where whereas at the moment if they have a traditional bank account which is underpinned by laws and regulations and government bonds and you know the government will protect you and and i can but tell you that michael in 
Yeah. On that, cashless society, the government is coming at you with cashless society. Isn't that going to disadvantage just as many people remotely? You know, older people who can't go into the bank and they used to cash. A lot of these points are coming to it where there is going to be a clash between the, the Luddites, and I include myself mm -hmm. as a Luddite in certain areas, and the, the technologically advanced. I mean, I was pretty chuffed when I could program a VCR in front of my father and thought, what an idiot. But I doubt whether I will be able to do half the things that my kids can do. So mm -hmm. th th there is a transition of technology that happens all the time. Yeah. But cash as society is really going to affect a lot of this anyway. And allowing the government to do that, wouldn't that affect a lot of this? I, look, absolutely, and, the, and the, that notion of technology changing how consumers, you know, access their funds and purchase goods and all that has de dramatically changed. You know, the introduction of telephone banking was, you know, even before the internet was it was a bit scary for for people, uh, and then it's the then the internet. It's like what you can do banking on, on in, a, in a web browser. That's not going to work. Uh, and then the banks start forcing everyone's hand by shutting branches down left, right and centre and that rationalisation still, you know, continues on a steady march to some extent. Um, yeah, I, I feel for, um, you know, the older generations who, who still struggle with that. I, I saw stats on uh, checking accounts. There's, so checking accounts, no, I think it's less than 5% of accounts or, you know, even less than that now. Um, the checks just don't exist anymore. Hmm. You know, not, not personal yeah. checking accounts anyway. I think the only country that does it is America. Yeah. Hacker mm -hmm. Man, what do you reckon? Well, see, we're running out of time, but I really want to talk about pump and dump because it's my favorite thing about crypto. <laughs> because <laughs> it's like, your know, favorite like, thing full stuff. <laughs> yeah, I like a pump and a dump. <laughs> Let's just real quick, real quickly, because we are, we are running dangerously out of time, but like the, it is an amazing thing that can exist but like the fact that it is unregulated means that like for example elon musk years ago he um he tweeted i'm going to take my company in-house i'm not going to i'm going to take it off the stock market price of the stock went through the roof and he got massively investigated like you had no intention you just tweeted that to get that so he then says oh we're gonna um offer bitcoin as a currency bitcoin flies to the roof okay after he does that tweet then a week later, after, you know, I'm sure he bought some before he tweeted, he says, actually, it's bad for the environment. We're removing it. It skyrockets down, okay, or whatever the word, it shoots down, <laughs> which he then Plummets. bought more. You know, like, so, like, no one can prove that he does that, but we all know he would have a crap load of Bitcoin. He probably made more from Bitcoin that year than he did from selling Teslas. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to say that, he's doing that there's no the government can't get in and say you're manipulating currency um and i guess that's my only issue with it is that this exists in currency by the way like we just talked about that but mm. i guess it's easier for like anyone to do it now mm. oh absolutely and again it just comes back to fueling speculation through rumor and and, and stories right and it's like if you go on to any kind of crypto any of the popular crypto exchanges today one of the things you'll notice is it's not you know obviously bitcoin is just one of hundreds of cryptocurrencies that are now available mm. and i think one of the other kind of scams that's happening now is this 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 land grab of let's just create a cryptocurrency because we know that there are enough speculative investors out there who are just going to buy in you know at the earliest opportunity they can and the founders of those cryptocurrencies end up profiting um, you know, and just sell out and then move on to the next one. And so I think there's this whole other kind of evolution of scam that's potentially unfolding now. Where it's just this, and, and I think that the, the, that whole ICO um, uh, trend kind of did peak around sort of 2019, but I think we're still seeing the long, the long tail of that. Um, back to the Tesla investment uh, in Bitcoin, I think that was on public record that they'd invested over a billion dollars in, mm. in Bitcoin. Yeah, that's after, what I thought. I just I didn't remember whether that was official. After the um, after the pushback, because what they what Tesla also did was they made the investment, the strategic investment in Bitcoin, and then they also announced that they would accept um, payment for Tesla vehicles in Bitcoin. Now the problem mm, yeah. with Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency is that it's consuming. I think the uh, the same amount of electricity that Greece 
um, consumes as an entire country. You know, like they're they're comparing the the the, um, the energy requirements for mining Bitcoin to entire countries nowadays, um, yeah. and that's just going to keep increasing because of the the computation that's required and the and the energy that that draws to keep the network um, operating. And then of course everyone said, well, hang on, that's not environmentally friendly, and that's kind of at odds with what Tesla is all about. So it, then it, it makes us think, money. But Michael, what what we need to do is get into leaves. I reckon that we should just get a whole lot of leaves and trade leaves, and then we burn the forests, and then we've got like the leaves, and we'll have lots of money, which we get when we have leaves, right? So just leaf change coin. it to leaves. Leaf, leaf coin. coin. You I have think. to put the word yeah. coin on the end of any idea these days. It's just I, paper. I leaf coin, you know? Common sense uh, coin. Paper money. Paper money. It's already there for you. Well, I, get it leaves. I, I, did, a, I did a mat and asked a, I, I threw a, a three fuel in the fire and went to five minutes. I'm, I'm so, glad you're on my side, dear Tony. Yeah, it is fun, bro. you got to do it sometime. Uh, but next, we are next week. Time. Yeah, we are out of time. So, Michael, thank you so much. Um, this was fun, and I love talking about all sorts of things, especially random stuff. But um, hopefully people have learned that, you know, that there are some – would you still say as long as they – Ask another question, Tony. Ask another up. question, heck man. <laughs> would you still say, though, because I always have an opinion that people should have a little bit of something. Would you still say people should <laughs> learn about this as a final tip? Oh, like, should people oh, understand? Absolutely. Crypto? I think yeah. that – I think that if you know if you've got a little bit of money, I, I look. I'm not giving investment advice, obviously, but my approach has been to uh, invest a little, a fest, invest what I can afford to lose, um, and I'm really being in, in it for the long term. I don't think I personally don't believe that anyone who trades cryptocurrency in the short term, like they think they are a, a day trader or they think they can can exploit the ups and downs and the volatility. Leave that stuff to your Wall Street, you know, guys yeah. who are probably Leave just killing it through that. Um, the rest of us have no hope in hell of making money using that strategy. It's, that's my personal belief. So yep. I just put in a small uh, investment, one I can afford to lose and hang on to it for the long term. I think that's a better strategy for, and that's what I'm doing. Um, but the, the, the place where I'm storing my crypto, more importantly, is in a hardware wallet. And I'd encourage people to definitely look at using a hardware-based wallet it's a little usb, it's a sticks, little right? USB yeah. key i use a thing called a ledger nano um yeah. and you know like 100 bucks 150 bucks where they are and it's a it's a worthwhile investment to make sure you transfer your crypto holdings into something like that and but even then i'll just quickly don't finish with throw a, them in the trash <laughs> don't throw them in the trash um there is you do create some backup uh word, word list that you need to keep securely uh, hopefully uh, somewhere else that's safe um, but the, even then, I can tell you that scammers even worked out how to exploit hardware wallets by oh. buying them from the factory, um, initializing oh. them, printing yeah. out the secret password codes, but keeping a copy for themselves, r changing the setup instructions, re shrink wrapping them, and then reselling them through eBay and other places. And the victims would buy these, these hardware wallets <laughs> think that they're setting them up according to the instructions but the attackers already know all of the private keys that this thing is going to generate and then these hackers, hackers, you know, these hackers are smart guys so buy Very direct right. from buy buy these direct don't buy, buy direct from, from the supplier use a use a hardware wallet and yep. um don't don't day trade so i mean those of you that you know, there's five people that listen and listen to the end. You you got some tips right at the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so again. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave I'll leave you with this final thing. Bitcoin reminds me a little bit of my casino days. How do you how do you um, make a small fortune? You start with a large one. So that's what <laughs> I think. All right. I'll leave you on that note. Nice. All right. Thanks for watching, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Cheers. Thanks,